All right, we are in Genesis, what chapter are we in? 15. <clears throat> Folks, we've been in 15 for how long? <laughs> Everybody should have gone, it's 15. Thank you, sir. Kind, sir. <laughs> um, and um, we... Um, Uh, I, I would like to say that we're getting close to finishing 15. We are in these smaller notes here, but uh, when I started in this section, I told you that I had some notes also in my main notes that I was gonna hit these first and then come back. So I don't know, um, I don't think it's gonna be a whole lot, but uh, we are looking now at um, verses 14 uh, through 16. And this is the words that God is speaking to Abram uh, in the throes of, you, you remember the whole thing, the, the sacrifices being laid open, the lamp, the fire of God passing through to receive the sacrifices, darkness falling, um, um, a horror, it says, uh, of darkness, and um, uh, and then these words um, are coming forth from that. And uh, this is sort of at the end of, of those things having been said, but it's still part of it, okay? Verse 14, <clears throat> and also that nation whom they shall serve, because remember it said they shall this, your, your seed will go into to, um, bondage in Egypt for 400 years. <clears throat> That's a long time, if, you know. Uh, and also that nation whom they shall serve, talking about Egypt, will I judge, and afterwards they shall come at it with great substance. And thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. When he says come hither again, he's talking about the seed coming out of Egypt and coming back into the land that God promised to Abram. And all that he promised to Abraham and to his seed, okay? So, <clears throat> Basically, it says, well, they're going to go through all of this stuff. <clears throat> they're going to go into bondage, and they're going to be used and abused and all of that kind of stuff. <clears throat> and, uh, but it says of Abraham, who is the father of all this, he says, but you'll, you'll go in peace in a good old age. So basically what I got from that is that the father is not going to go into these deaths, but his son will. The father never went through all of this, but his son did. But you have to understand, and we won't really understand that, or at least we won't get an opportunity to really understand that until Genesis chapter 22, which if you think we're spending a long time in 15, man, 22, I'm telling you, he's just pouring and pouring, and has been for, I, I think that, much of this started coming to me right after the prodigal son, not just once I got to Cain and Abel. And it's really something. Anyway, so drink time. <clears throat> and it says in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again for for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full, okay? So <clears throat> there is this iniquity of the Am Amorites. There is this, what I term Amorite treatment that, <clears throat> that we have. Um, I wrote, God brought Israel out of the promised land and put them in bondage because of their Amorite treatment of the firstborn, Joseph. That wasn't seed treatment. You understand what I'm saying? That, 
the treatment that the brothers did to Joseph was more like the Amorites than it was to the seed of God. And so, um, so I'll read that again. God brought Israel out of the promised land and put them in bondage because of their Amorite treatment. And I put treatment of his firstborn son, which Joseph was his name, but it represented God's firstborn. It represented the cross. It represented the death. It represented, it represented him being beaten. It represented him being rejected. It represented him uh, basically uh, put into bondage and all of that representing Christ who laid down his life and uh, uh, did that for the Amorites, as it were, for the Pharisees, for what, who are the people that you don't like that you think do stuff to you. Really, write their name in there. Um, write your name in there <laughs> as an Amorite, you know. Um, <clears throat> the father is bringing about this horror. There was two real things there. There was the horror and there was the darkness. And this is, I believe, this is the horror part, uh, is that Abraham saw this picture. I don't know if it was the, you know, if it was just a sort of a picture that God gave him because God is explaining it, but he kind of saw that his own seed would take one that God had, had put his hand on to represent the firstborn and they would do this to him and would see all that Joseph goes through in that situation and all of the, 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 uh, the things, the horrors, as it is, that his, his son is going through, whom God said, God gave him a vision, God showed him. God was the one who at the very beginning showed him, yes, Joseph didn't handle it well, right? We agree with that. He, got all puffed up and stuff like that. But that doesn't take away the fact that God showed him that, and it did come to pass. And so this is, the, the father is um, um, is seeing this horror. This is what you're doing to my son. This is what you're doing to the one that I said would, you know, bring you into all the things that Joseph ends up bringing him to bread for, for in famine and all those things. <clears throat> so, um, so I wrote the reason given for being in bondage for so long was because of the sin of the Amorites was not yet full. Okay, they're in bondage for how long? 400 years. Why 400 years? It doesn't say, well, God randomly picked a number. It says because of the iniquity of the Amorites was not yet full, that the sin of the was not yet full. Um, and, um, and so I, I just wrote down, when, when you or I look and judge, if we're judging in the wrong spirit instead of by the spirit of Christ, we are Amorites. Do you remember when Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged? You remember that? And we, we kind of go, well, you know, I'll still judge. <laughs> but I mean, um, um, when we look at somebody and we're judging them, we're judging as Amorites. We're saying they're Amorites. You kind of, yeah. But, but the fact that we're judging instead of laying down our life, see, Jesus said, I didn't come to judge. I came, you know, I came to lay down my life. Um, then we're wrapped up in the earth. We're wrapped up in, well, this is our land. We're Amorites, you know, and you were, you know, we were here first before you Jews or whatever, however, whatever mentality is, uh, that, that the, the subject matter of name of Amorite and Jew doesn't matter at all. It's always a spirit. I mean, there's a spirit of 
a lamb and there's a spirit of a goat. And again, the nations are divided by a certain spirit. Lambs, sheep on the right, goats on the left. Enter into my joy, be banished from my presence. Um, if that's not an actual real thing that happens, I believe that that's a real thing in God's heart. You see what I mean? That that would, if, if it's not just a literal thing that happens, I believe that that's true in God's heart. He sent his son that we might not just, not just learn, not, follow, not just read the gospels and, and see how he did stuff. It's not enough to do that. We'll, that will never get in us enough to shape us up, <laughs> you know? I mean, we can hear a lot of teaching. Did you know that? You know what? I hear a lot of teaching because it comes out of my mouth, right? <laughs> I hear a lot of teaching, but it better not be teaching in me. Woe unto me if it's just teaching. I better have a heart that says I must have this Jesus. God, my Father, do not let me act like I'm, I'm Randy, who is not your son. When I said my Father, God, my Father, do not let me act like Randy, who is not your son. Let it be the son, the firstborn, the one that came to give himself, to pour himself out. And, you know, when that's your heart, then what do you think the Father's going to do? What do you think the Holy Spirit's going to do? He is going to work in any way he can to bring you into that. But can you believe that there are prayers that we can pray that say the same thing, but there's not the real, it's not like, I am, you, sorry, I'm jumping, but you know these songs that say I'm desperate for you? Is it possible to sing that and not be desperate? Do you think that maybe we do it more often than we do it when we're desperate? You know, and I've often said, but you know, I, I, you know, I've said we just shouldn't sing it if it's not there. You know, I mean, in other words, it would be okay if, you know, let's say that that Scott's leading worship and we're doing a song, and in that song it says, "I am desperate for you," and when we get to the part where it says. I am desperate for you. Nobody sings it. And then we just go on to the rest of the verses and stuff like that. And we go, you know what I'm saying? We go, well, that'd be terrible. That might be wonderful. Because it means we recognize that we're not. And, and if we add to that, I want to be. You know, we always, we always go into guilt. Well, I'm not desperate for you. And Randy, you're making it worse. It's my job. <laughs> I'm supposed to make everything worse so you can hate me. But, but it's a good sign if you, if you actually stopped and said, said, I can't sing that right now. You know? It's like, it would be like if, if you stopped and you didn't take communion on one particular Sunday. Well, I can't not take communion. Everybody go, oh, man, they must have really sinned. Right? They must really be off from the Lord. What if they're really on and a whole bunch of other people are just taking it on cruise control? What if, what if they would be one of the only ones really on? See, we're Amorites. And we judge. And we judge it wrong, on a wrong basis. One of the reasons why Jesus didn't want us to judge is because we don't have his, his spirit and nature formed in us yet, so it's like, don't look, just don't judge, you'll be better off, <laughs> you know what I mean? You know, because you can't judge correctly. Well, Jesus said of himself, well, I, I judge righteous judgment. You remember that? He said that, I, I judge righteous judgment. Okay, well then, should we look at Jesus and say, uh-uh, you're not supposed to judge? No. But he's saying don't judge or judge righteous judgment and you'll be judged based on righteous judgment, <laughs> you know, in a good way, meaning. 
So this thing of the Amorites, uh, it really reminds me just of that, all of what I've been saying here because um, uh, I, I sort of saw the land and I saw the Amorites were already in the land and I saw that Israel, you know, that, that really Abraham's the first one. Abram came in and, you know, at first he kind of, I don't know if you know this, but at first he got along with the Amorites. You know, he didn't stir stuff up or whatever. And he didn't, one of the things that, that why people attack is because they feel threatened. Did you know that? They feel threatened. They go, well, Abraham, if you're going to start trying to take our land, we'll kill you. But if you're not, you can, here, we'll give you this part of the land and take just a small amount of money or whatever, you know. If they feel threatened, why would someone feel threatened? Because we feel like we're, you know, we, we're something. And, um, you know, I was recently in a situation where uh, the leader went down, as it were, and the second in charge uh, became the pastor. And, and I'm immediately in the middle of that situation. And the last thing I need to do, and this person doesn't know me as well as the person who was the pastor before, the last thing I need to do is let him make him feel threatened. Like he doesn't know. I mean, he might go, you know, obviously Randy's here and, you know, everybody talks about him coming and all this kind of stuff. And just get low, just get low and bring Jesus from that place. And the Spirit will bring more life instead of then now everything's on a wrong basis. You know, well, I have to come that way because. I'm somebody special. Really? Really? Do you need God to show you <laughs> you're not that special? You know? Yes, you do. <laughs> the answer is yes. You, you need him to show you that you're not that special. You're really not that good, okay? You know, I, I say that to people all the time. I heard somebody, you know, I, this happens all the time, somebody goes, oh, you ought to hear what Randy shared. I say, really, you don't need to. It's, I've heard me preach and it's not that good. I say that a lot. If the Spirit of God falls on it, good. But if he doesn't bring it and bring his, the Spirit of the Lamb within that, the nature of the Lord in that, then it's just words. It is vain words, even if they're Bible words. I can't stand it. I can't, I can't live that way. I can't be that way. I must have you, Lord. I must have you now. I need you. I need you more than the people I talk to. I'm worse than the people I talk to. I, you know what I mean? I mean, you, get, you can get to a place where you just, your only focus is, I want you. And if you're put in a situation to preach or lead worship or take care of the kids or whatever, spirit comes out but as long as the Amorites are there God's holding off on the release amen as long as the Amorites are taking over he didn't want to bring his seed back in you know he must increase and the Amorites must decrease you know praise God all right so um, when you look and judge Amorites in someone else, you are as good as judging yourself. I will drink to that. <laughs> Amen. You almost got it going. Mallory could have got a chant going. Amen. 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 Man, it's a stand on the inside of you. It's the rod of God. You know, it's not in your hand. You're not Moses. Jesus is the rod of God, which is inside of you to, to give strength and to, and to be strong in the Lord and the power of his mind. 
verse 16, but in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. Um, so I wrote, after the right time, he brought them back into the land with a new attitude. Okay. All right. Now, they came back in, and they took more ground, and they, you know, all of that. But there's another way of seeing it and, and saying it, and that is, after the right time, he brought them back into the land with a new attitude to destroy what was in them, the Amorites. I'm going to take this land. The, you, you, you know, I mean, if you want to fly over to the promised land, you know, the holy land over there, go ahead and do it, you know. But this is the land I need to take. Some of you know that, that some Jewish people over the years, many times, and different ones have said to me, you know, have you ever been to the, to the Holy Land? You know, you ever been to the Holy Land? No. You're Jewish and you haven't been to the Holy Land? You've got Jewish blood in you? And my response is, I'm too busy going to the unholy land. Here's the unholy land, me. You know, I don't need to go over there and try to take that land as it were. You understand what I'm saying, but I... I do need to take this land. And instead of going, well, you know, I can't wait till Jesus splits the eastern sky and puts his foot down into the, you know, the vineyard of the Lord, which is the, you know, place where he poured out his soul to the Father. Here. This is where I need him. This is where I need him. And, and I figure, this is my figure, and I figure if he can take any portion of this, it'll have its effect wherever he wants it to. I don't have to know and order it and, you know, dictate and say, well, I would only be considered important if it went in this direction, you know, this place where you know, my name would be known or whatever, but no, no, no. I don't want my name. You know, we don't do things in our name, or do we? <laughs> you do it in the name of Jesus, you know. We don't do things in our name, but do we? Do we regularly? Do we, do we regularly do things in our own name, and do we regularly not even think I'm doing this in his name? See, because it's usually just that phrase makes it holy. I'm doing this in the name of Jesus. Holy, holy. By, by saying that, just by saying in the name of Jesus, not really doing, I'm doing this in your name. This is for you, for your glory. In your name, may this be done, not in my name. And, and that's, what, what do you do with your hands? What do you do with your mouth? What do you do with, you know, uh, and again, what I'm saying is how often do we stretch forth our hand and our, I'm going to say it like this, our hand says, I'm doing this in Jesus' name. But we do things so that others will notice. We do things to get a little higher stature as we go instead of to get lower and to be okay with being low so that he could be exalted and to really feel that way. I mean, you know, because it's a great saying, you know what I mean? Oh, I want to be lower so he can be exalted. Oh, yes. And it's because I'm so holy and humble. Man, you just let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> it's about you and how you, how you want to appear to people. So. You know, when he can begin to control our mouth that speaks, whether it's saying things to exalt ourselves to others in the eyes of others, or it is um, trying to work our way somewhere, trying to manipulate something. Because you know, do y'all know you can actually say stuff 
and it even could have the name of Jesus in it, just Jesus. And it's really, we're working the situation for our benefit, you know. Well, it's almost insane to say you shouldn't do that. <laughs> unless, you know, unless it's people that just really want the Lord. But we do, we do, we do. And so, I mean, it's really the same thing I was talking about, you know, not being able to sing um, um, I'm desperate for you and just leave those words out and pick up on the word, the next verse or the next word after desperate and say, I can sing this part, but I can't sing that. Or I can't take communion today because I'm not in communion and I'm not, I, you know, I don't have the lamb. And here's the deal. Trust me on this. Okay. Trust me on this. You need to have the lamb in you before you eat bread and drink a little sippy cup. You need, that's supposed to be in remembrance of his death here. He was put to death, and I put that in me when I got born again, and I do this in remembrance of that. But we make the symbols, oh, magic, magic bread, magic crackers, or whatever. I don't even know what, the, what, what all we use here. I, I think it is crackers, <laughs> you know. And if it was so magic, you know, we should just break off a big old piece and say, I need a lot of magic. But one little crumb that is him is better than all of me. Amen. <laughs> Guess who really feels that way? The father. <laughs> he really feels that way. That one little crumb, he's going, there's my son. He really does do that. This is my beloved son. And we go, and then we step in front of that little crumb and go, yeah, me? And he goes, no, not you, you. That little one, that lowly one. So, um, So th that new attitude was, what a wretched man that I am. In other words, this is, a, this is an important basis. You will never, ever, ever truly exalt Jesus until you see that it's pretty much worthless to try to make yourself what only he can be. Okay. So when you begin to see, oh, wretched man that I am, when you begin to see that, well, what's, you know, what's the next chapter say? You know, then it starts talking about God's reality concerning his son. In fact, that's uh, Romans 7, um, verse 14. You can turn there if you want, uh, but keep your place in Genesis, or you can just let me read this and comment however you want to do that. Romans 7 and verse 4, starting with verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal and sold under sin. Okay, well, how many of us know that? <clears throat> All right, how is the law spiritual? If the law is spiritual, then why is God doing away with it and making a new covenant? Right? Then why? Y'all see how I ask a lot of questions? I really ask a lot of questions. Then why is that? Because it sounds like you're contradicting yourself and proving my point when you save me. <laughs> because the law condemns us and shows us that we're not the one. Okay. We say, well, the law condemns us and, you know, da, da, and we need to be condemned so that we can become spiritual. No. The law condemns us as the answer. We're not it. We need to be convinced of it. You're not it. Oh, wretched man that I am, who? It ain't me. Who then? Right? If it ain't me, then who? <clears throat> Verse 15, for that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Okay? <clears throat> now, 
we say, you know, there's a time period um, there's a time period, it's a very short time period in the Christian life when you will go through Romans 7. Um, some people live there their whole Christian life, you know. Some people never get there. They never see this contrast and, and let the Lord use it to ultimately glorify his son all we can see is that, you know, at first, I need to be brought low. Well, you know, that's like, I've used this example before, but that's like being a farmer and you go out to the dirt and you, you get a hoe and so you're working on your garden and you break up the ground and everything and you get all the dirt broken up and you walk off and say, there, I did it, I'm all broken. I'm broken before the Lord. And he's going, where's the seed? I want the seed. I want something living. The dirt is dead. It's not moving except those grub worms. And that ain't you either. <laughs> the Samurai's in you. <laughs> you know? And he's going, I want to see my son. I want my son because why? Because I know what he will do. He'll do in you what you could never do. Dirt cannot bring forth fruit. It can't. Even broken. Oh, I'm so broken before you. Do you like it? <laughs> yeah, he, he likes it only in relationship to his son. There is no brokenness of itself that is glorious to God. You know, there are whole churches and Christians and even movements that are, you know, let's, we got to be broken. Okay, yeah, but that's only a step toward something. And you can, you can not put any seed in that dirt and water the dirt all the time. And you know what you get out of it? Mud. You get mud. Yeah. So, man. It just seems like things are getting muddier. I don't know. I'm not getting as much clarity as I w thought I was getting, you know. Well, that's because you keep dumping the word on you and thinking it's going to make you, oh, I'm beautiful. I'm, I'm stretching my arms towards the sun. I'm feeling the warmth of the sun. And the Lord's going, you're making mud snowmen. You know, it's not even snow in it. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. No good thing? No good thing? Has anybody ever argued with that scripture before? I have, too. I have really argued with it. I said, well, wait a minute. You know, this is early on, but you know, you love me and you know, I'm your special creation. You ever heard songs say that about us? You're my special, we are his special creation. Let's just enter in now and glorify ourselves. We're everything that you ever wanted. Oh, I feel so gloriously beautiful, you know, and he's going, You know, and the mud of the fields will clap their hands. <laughs> God help us all. I mean, if we see this properly, apparently Paul sees it properly, amen? And it's okay. You know, you, you know this, and I've spoken to it before, but I've preached along these lines, and I remember one time in, in Nicaragua and uh, several other places in the States, and people would come up after, and they'd go, but Brother Randy, you know, what is it, where does that leave us? And, you know, where's, you know, I mean, are we just going to be just dull, empty, dumb people with no personality and no fun ever again? And they're sincere, you know, it's like, I heard what you said, and it, really sounds horrible you know is there any and I go 
Okay, do I look like I'm a dull, dumb, lack, lacking fun kind of person? You know, I mean, uh, I just preach that and I believe I'm living according to it. It doesn't mean you end up, you know, being a, a toad, you know. It means that Christ will blossom in you, but it'll be Christ. There will be fruit. There will be joy. I, I say these things unto you that your joy might be full. But what thing, where did he quote that at? John what? John 15. I am the vine, you are the branches. And I'm saying all of this about that so that your joy might be full. And you're going... Yes, I, my joy is so full because you're doing it. It's your fruit. It's your life. And I'm plugged into you and you're flowing through and bringing it forth. And it ain't me. Amen. And I'm really happy it ain't me because I want it to be you because you are everything to me. You know, we go, Jesus said in those same verses, he said, without me, you can do nothing. So it's similar to this one right here to me. You know, I argued and I said, you know, yeah, I can look. I'm doing stuff. Look, I'm drinking. Did you do that in me? And he'd go, I'm going to squash you like a bug. You keep talking like that, buddy. <laughs> and then the Holy Spirit shows up to show me Christ. To show me. Because even though I'm dumb and I'm maybe a little weird with my relationship with God he still comes through because I think he knows I really want Jesus and sometimes that contrast of, of just busting out and saying well what about this to him he goes hey we got a winner over here <laughs> you know someone is not just you know the did, did, did any of you older people ever see the original movie called The Time Machine? Deb did. did. All right. And, uh, yeah. And so they have the, uh, I don't even remember the name of them, the, the E, e it wasn't the Ewoks, that's another, <laughs> but, but they were people that were living, you know, and, but they were just, they were normal. But then all of a sudden this sound would go and they would all just drop everything and they would all just be walking toward really death because the, the warlocks were underground and they were going to eat you. I see, I see dead people. <laughs> I see people just going through the motions. <laughs> I see people just, you know, a certain sound, you know, it's like uh, like school bell, ding-a-ding-a-ding, and everybody just goes, so, you know, and I didn't. <laughs> they sit behind their desk and all this, and I'm over there going, <laughs> Anyway, um, they go, they hear the church bell, and they go, oh, yes, oh, da, 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 and they're just going through the motions. It's like, stop it. Wake up. Let's go for the Lord. Let's be serious. Let's dig deep now. Let's, let's, let's go for the gold, you know what I mean, of Christ, the, the nature within us. And the Spirit of God will back that up. All you got to do is, is sort of try to stay with it for like 20 minutes. And he'll, you know, and he'll, he'll move on it. Try to last more than 20 minutes, okay? I'm just hoping that that would happen. For the good that I would do, I do not. But the evil which I would, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present within me, for I delight in the law of God after the inward man. So he's saying, I want to do the right thing. I delight in it. He's not saying, I'm a rank sinner and I could care less. These aren't the words of somebody that is just a rank, you know, whatever they, you know, I don't even believe in God or that sort of thing. This is somebody that cares about it, but it has to be 
a delight in the Lord, not just in the word or the law. You understand the word. It has to be a delight in the Lord. Um, I was talking to somebody today, and, and um, they were saying, um, you know, this thing of death, you know. We're always talking about death. We're all, you know, and it just, it just scares me, and I feel like it could, you know, you know, it, I just feel like it's, it just scares me. I don't, I just feel repelled. And I said, well, maybe your focus is wrong. And they said, what do you mean? And I said, it's not about death. It's about Jesus. It's about a heart that loves Jesus and will go after Jesus and says, Jesus, I want you. And I said, if your heart is going after Jesus, that's what you, you got to focus. It's narrow. Jesus, the living Son of God, the one, the real one, that's who I want. And I said, in time as he's being formed more in you, because I said, it, you know, you're, you're wondering, well, how can, you know, both of those things be in me? I want Jesus, but I don't want to die. <laughs> and I said, it's real simple. The outward man perishes, but the inward man is renewed day by day. He must increase, then guess what? I got to decrease. I said, it's all working. It's both sides are in there. I said, but your focus has to be him, not death. And I said, when, when you get to the place where death becomes an issue, it won't be you anymore. It'll be Christ in you. It'll be the one who will give himself. It will be the one who has given himself. It will be the one um, that you... Uh, that you love and that you've given your life to, to go after him. And I said, I've said this to a couple of people already, um, but that, um, that our, that the death that the Bible is talking about and the death that I talk about, I said to this person, it's nothing like what you're picturing in your head. It's nothing like that. It's nothing like that. I mean, I remember when we were in Bible school and they were talking about death and I'm going, you know, my out, do y'all remember what my out was so I could survive? Yeah, they were all, they're all gonna be missionaries because that's it was that kind of school so they need to die to their self. But I was gonna be a great evangelist. And uh, so I could let the <laughs> death go, yeah, amen, you folks need that. Because <laughs> you're going to face some tough stuff, but I'm going to be rich and drive a Cadillac. Okay. <laughs> Never got a Cadillac. Mm, I'm far from rich. <laughs> so, so I just said, your view the debt that we're talking about, your view is nothing like that. And I said, the only way that you can get to that is you have to stop focusing on your view of debt. No, don't make death the issue, make Christ the issue. Say, I love Jesus, I'm going after Jesus. And then as he's formed in you, then his nature can handle those things. And it's done by Christ, it's done by the firstborn instead of by the secondborn or the third, or the, you know, it's him. And it is, and it's the answer, not just to death, but everything. It's, he is that answer. And like, for example, the death, there's so many angles to death that we will, we'll, you know, you'll be throughout the eternal ages to come understanding all of that. But there's a finished death and there's a living death, if you will, and that's the Lamb of God. He's live, he lives to give himself. And I said to this person, do you live to give yourself? And they said, nope, focus on Jesus. <laughs> right, right, focus on Jesus, quit getting all, all, everything else is just a distraction. Your heart says Jesus, your mind says, I don't want that death. No, no, no. Don't point over there, buddy. Point into your cranium. 
because that's where your wrong picture of death is. <laughs> Amen. Verse 23, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. So this first part, I see then another law in my members warring against the law of my mind. So there's all this, uh, there's all this war going on. I mean, you know, well, I don't understand how, well, I don't get how every one of those are based on your own carnal trying to figure it out and and questioning some things that god said i, I hope you you got that it's questioning things god said but you're questioning him on on the basis of a wrong perception of what he said so you're questioning whether it's a wrong perception and you're not intentionally questioning god you're questioning what god said so how do you avoid that? It's real simple. You just say, I have no clue what this means. Um, you know, something that I've found in life, you know, I've always wanted to, to get older and be able to pass wisdom on. Not there yet, but you know, it'd be nice when I have found in life that things are never as bad as we think they are, and they're never as good as we think they are. <laughs> I really, I mean, maybe this isn't true for everybody. Maybe it's not a universal truth, but I think that it might be. Because we have these perceptions in our mind and our understanding of what it's going to be or how it's going to be. And it's, it, besides, it's not about how bad uh, or how good, good and evil. It's not about that anyway. It's about him. And there's no words that you can put on him and a true relationship with him according to his nature being in you and you loving him and loving that nature. You, you loving him. And then when it, when it comes out of you, you don't go, oh, I really hated giving up that you know, whatever, giving up those tickets to the whatever, you know. You, 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 the love that you have for Jesus is not based on the fact he died for you personally so you wouldn't go to hell. It becomes a love of how you are, the nature, the lamb, the spirit, the selflessness, the incredible thing that makes you different from every other human I've ever met in my whole life. That's what I want. So when it starts coming in you, it is beyond the word fellowship. It is, it's love. God is love. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then we get brought into that. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. And then boop, we get brought into that. But we don't, we're not seen. See, I'm really holding up four fingers. Here we are. <laughs> here we are back here hidden in Christ. And it is as pure, Jesus said, that they may know our oneness that we had before the foundation of the world. Well, there it is. You know how you know? Because you're not seen. It's pure oneness. But you're full of the one who is seen. And it's your greatest joy that he would be the one that's glorified in, the, in this situation. It's beautiful to you. It's not like, this is the day I dreaded. It's <laughs> the worst day of my life. I'm having to lay down my life. You know, that person's long, you know, hung on a cross, buried, done away. And it's, it's that your joy might be full. Full. Praise God. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Okay, so the body of this death, if you just make it your own physical body, well, who's going to do that in you? It's going to be Christ. It's not you. The whole of what we read is the attempt 
by someone who wants the Lord and fails miserably. Do you all understand that? It is by someone who genuinely wants and loves the Lord and is trying to do right. They're not, they're not like I was before I met Jesus. Woohoo! Let's just bust hell wide open. You know? <laughs> Wait till we get to the end and then repent. <laughs> no. No, this is... This is someone genuinely pressing and concerned. And when I want, you know, I, here I am again, back at this same place. Any, sound familiar to anyone? You know, and then, but the goal was to reach this place. Oh, wretched man that I am. And then who? Oh, wretched man that I am. Who? then will live this, will produce the joy, the fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, gentleness, meekness, faith, long-suffering, temperance, all of that. Who's, who's going to produce all that? Well, it's going to come out of Christ. It's going to come out of the Spirit of God lifting up Christ. It's going to come out of Jesus lifting up the Father. It's going to come out of the Father exalting His Son. It's going to flow and go and, you know, um, I, I'll, I'll end with this, and I don't. Yeah, I think we started just a little late because uh, um, the other day, and I don't remember where I was. <laughs> so many places that it's. Ah, I really, honestly, I, it's. And I was, I was um, leaning up against a post and looking out over a cityscape. And what I mainly was seeing was man, what man had built. <clears throat> and um, the buildings didn't move at all, but I could see trees over here and there moving, moving. They were living. And I, and I looked at all this stuff, and even though I saw a car moving, it was, it was, there was no life in it. And then I looked up and the clouds were moving and the wind was moving and I was just going, oh my God. I mean, it really did hit me. It's like everything lives that he, he made and touches, including us, I mean, in that sense. But I mean, it's like I'm getting to look at it in one fell swoop with the contrast of all this stuff that we had made and it was all static. And I went, that's my Jesus, that's him. He's alive, and he wants to be alive. He doesn't want to be a doctrine. He doesn't want to be, you know, a book that you hand and say, here's another static thing. Read my book. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm not talking about the Bible. I'm talking about my book, you know. He wants, he, it's just in him, life and the way of movement of the water and all of this and, it's just like, oh, my. I mean, I really was just like, so, I was so moved by that. See, moved by it. Something was moving. And, and it just made me more determined that it not be static stuff, you know, because we don't even think that way. Well, let's arrange these things like that, and people will really be moved by the Lord. No, I mean, no, no. I mean, ultimately, there has to be something of God that is moving before it can move us. Yeah. It's the only way I know how to put it. Yeah. I mean, on a certain front, it sounds like gibberish, but I know what I saw. I saw something that deeply affected me, and I was just going, God made that. God didn't make that. God made that. God didn't make that. God, you know, it was just that quick it was like I could go it fast and just go my God is real and alive and moves and wants to be that way and you know when we get stagnated and whatever it's only because there's a lack of the Lord well we still got the Lord but let's let's let the river flow let's let the clouds move let's let you know you know what I'm saying fruit popping out you know you're going Ever so small, little bugs flying around. You're just going, everything you made moves. <laughs> it's alive. All right, let's pray. 
Oh, Father, my words fall so short, but I just love you, and we love you, and we're here. We didn't, the people on Skype and, and those of us who have gathered here tonight, we didn't just come here to hear a sermon. We didn't come here to listen to something that we've heard before and just dismiss it. We, we want you, the living God. There is a dead God, as it were, a God that has no movement, no life, no flow, no, uh, no nothing that, that can move us. But there is you, the real, the real. We want the real. And we want it enough to keep pressing and to keep saying, reveal this one more and more in us, that Christ may be revealed more and more in us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. From one glory to the next. So that you may be glorified by something that's living called your son. And something that's moving called the Holy Spirit that you can't see. But doggone it, it moves. We can see the evidence. So Lord, help us. Help us. You use that example wherever I was as I looked out and saw it, and it's so real to me. And, and Lord, we need more reality, real things that get us, that just get us. And we say, this just got me. It got me. And I'll never forget it. And I'll never forget what I saw of you compared to man. So, Father, thank you for your spirit. We ask a release, a release, a release of your spirit, uh, Lord, but that, that's only going to come. Israel's only going to be released out of Egypt when the Amorites, when the iniquity of the Amorites is full, and, and we're done with that, and we're, we're ready to move on in your life and your nature. So we do. We ask you not for our sake, but in Jesus' name, Father, and we mean that, not like that's a magic phrase. We mean it in his name and for his sake. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You are so precious. You are so precious. You are more precious than, them, than our words can say. Our words and our words of worship do fall short, but our hearts, when they say them, must ring in your ears beautifully because it's not the words. It's the heart behind it. You gave us that heart at, at salvation. You gave us a new heart, your spirit. You said, "That's this covenant will I make with him after those days. So we're not fighting for it. We're fighting to get rid of the things that we trust in, the things that we believe in, the things that we think are so important uh, about us. So may Romans 7 be our friend. May it be our friend. May it be the next greatest step from hearing all the wonderful truths of Romans 6. May it be a step into life, and, and Romans 8 begins to move in life and reality, and it's, it's powerful, and, and, and it shows the contrast of the, not the natural man, but the carnal mind, and it says it's my enemy, that's, that's your view. Why don't, we, why don't we not just love the things you love, but why don't we just hate the things you hate? Why don't we look at an enemy not just the devil, we do that with him somewhat, but why don't we, Father, look at, at our carnal mind and say, that's Jesus' enemy, and I'm, I'm with him, I'm with the Lord. Father, help us to see and to see clearly and to not be clogged and bogged down. <laughs> Lord, help us not to be blogged down, but to get life and word, the word of life from you oh we reach out with our hearts we do we reach out we're reaching out with our hearts and we say lord be in us be the way you want to be in us and father we will say 
as much as in us and we don't want to settle anymore we don't want to settle we don't want to settle for being married to the old man when we could be married to you we don't want to settle because we've tried to be married to you and it's not happening we don't want to settle for the old man we want we want the best we want you we want you oh glory 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 to you most beautiful most beautiful one so beautiful so so filling so satisfying are you oh god help us chase out religion help us awaken so that we can help to awaken others oh 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 we do we cry out if it's, if my words are ever so soft they are a cry a clear cry out of my heart oh lord 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 we love you we're sorry if we let other things get in the way we're sorry if we we got off track in any other way now we want you to be the way holy spirit come move enlighten the realities that are ours by him already make it real in the here and now enlighten us to what was finished long ago but make it real in our here and now by your life in us may may that finished work not be a stagnant building that we've built that doesn't move and doesn't have life but may it move into life and bring forth life and produce fruit and life and joy to you oh our husbandman oh father the husbandman longing for your fruit from these from this little slim branch that i am that we are father you showed me even recently a small almost a twig had so much fruit on it real fruit it was weighted down with it and father I think I think my wife pointed it out to me and I just wondered at it like this is a wonder this is this is something to be wondered at that such a small branch that you made that you had come forth on that tree was weighted down with fruit and you, you, all you could see was the fruit and the joy that this little branch could do that. Thank you, Father. May we not worry about our size and our stature. May we just believe that in our weakness, in our smallness, that you can outdo the bigger branches if you want to do that. But in our heart, it's not outdoing anybody. It is just letting you live in us. Just live in us and may you receive all the glory for what's produced. We love you. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you. We love your nail-scarred hands and your nail-scarred feet. We kiss them. We, we pour oil on them. We weep on them. We do it because we know what those scars represent, the nature that is you, the insides of you. We love you. We love you. We love you so much. And so we do ask these things, but not in our own name, but in Jesus' name. Amen.